Today's video is brought to you by Athletic Greens. More about them in just a bit. The winner is Sydney Poitier. And with those words, Sidney Poitier made history on April the 13th, 1964 at the 36th Academy Awards as he walked to the podium to a raucous ovation to receive the Oscar for Best Actor for his role as Homer Smith in Lilies of the Field. In the process, Sidney Poitier became the first black actor to win an Academy Award for a leading role, but that was just a small part of his impact on Hollywood. Poitier showed everyone that it was not only possible to showcase people of colour as genuine characters instead of racist caricatures, but it was also profitable. Audiences didn't shy away simply because Poitier played an educated man who was an equal to those around him. Quite the opposite, in fact, as they turned him into one of the biggest box office drawers of the 60s. Poitier was a pioneer, a role model, and an ambassador all rolled into one, and his influence on race relations in America during the 20th century was immeasurable. Sidney Poitier was born on February the 20th, 1927, the youngest of seven children to Reginald Poitier and Evelyn Oughton. His parents were tomato farmers from the Bahamas, back then still part of the British Empire, but Sidney was actually born in Miami, arriving two months premature while his parents were on a trip to Florida to sell their produce. From the very moment he was born, Sidney Poitier had to fight against the odds. He was a weak baby who weighed under three pounds at birth. His parents had already lost offspring before. Unfortunately, infant mortalities were a far too common occurrence on the remote cat Ireland where they lived. Reginald Poitier sought no future for his newborn son and had already visited an undertaker to prepare for the inevitable. Evelyn, however, was not ready to give up on her child, so she insisted that they remain in the United States to try and nurse their baby back to health. Her maternal efforts paid off, and after three months of tender loving care, young Sidney was strong and healthy and ready to go home. As an added bonus, his Miami birth gave him American citizenship, which would prove useful later on, but for now, it was back to the Bahamas. Life on Cat Island was hard, to say the least, but it was uniform. Basically, everyone was poor, and the locals relied on a barter economy about as much as they did on cold hard cash. By comparison to other islanders, uh, you could say the Poitiers were well off. They had their own horse and cart, and even a donkey, and their fields were always rich and fertile thanks to a nearby cave filled with bat guano. But at the same time, the entire family of nine lived in a three-room stone hut and wore shirts made out of empty flour sacks. For Sydney, this didn't matter because he didn't know a life other than this. He didn't know of large houses with electricity and running water. For him, once he was done with his chores, the entire island became his playground. He would spend the rest of his day roaming from one corner of the island to the other, fishing, climbing trees, swimming in the ocean, gathering fruit, or just sitting on the pier and watching the ships go by. Back home, Sidney indulged his artistic side from an early age. He was a natural-born performer, and he loved using old clothes to create characters for himself and act out scenarios in front of the family. Poitier considered his childhood on Cat Island idyllic, but he later realized that this was only if you were a child. For the grown-ups who were saddled with the burdens and responsibilities of adulthood, a life on Cat Island was no picnic, and it was made eminently worse by the arrival of the Great Depression. In 1936, Florida restricted tomato imports from the Bahamas, meaning that Reginald Poitier lost his main market. Just two years later, he concluded that life as a farmer on Cat Island was no longer tenable. He decided to pack up and move the family to the big city, the Bahamian capital of Nassau. So let me introduced to you AG1 by Athletic Greens. It is the nutritional cornerstone for your health journey. It's a combination of nine health products in one simple scoop, which replaces your multivitamin, multiminerals, pre and probiotics, immunity support, and more. It's designed to make taking care of your health much easier. It is a daily habit that I have. I typically have it in the morning, take a scoop from there, put it in here, shake it up with some water, and you are good to go. It takes I don't know what, a minute, and then you drink it, and it tastes good. AG1 is made up of 75 high quality vitamins and minerals. They're listed all on the back here. And it's manufactured to the strictest quality standards. The ingredients in AG1 support whole body health, impacting everything from sleep and digestion to energy and mood to immunity and more. Look, my everyday routine has changed because of AG1. Like I said, I have it with my coffee in the morning and I just feel like it increases my energy, it gives me that boost to continue my day. So click the link in the description below for a one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3 as a bonus, that's upside down. <laughs> And also five travel packs so you can stay up to date with your AG1 on the go. And now back to today's video.
Evelyn Poitier left Cat Island first, and she brought Sydney along. For the 11-year-old, sailing into Nassau was like stepping into a different dimension. From afar, he thought he saw the road filled with scurrying beetles, only to realize once he got closer, that they were cars. He saw houses with electricity for the first time and shops filled with all sorts of wondrous inventions like cameras and washing machines. It was even the first time that the young boy saw his face in a mirror. For Sydney, it was a world filled with new sights and experiences, but unfortunately not all of them were pleasant. For the first time ever, he became aware of the role that race played in the modern world. He wasn't a small child anymore who needed to be sheltered from the harsh realities of life. His parents, his siblings, and his friends made Sydney wise to the idea that he would face hardships, insults, hatred, and possibly even violence, all due to the color of his skin. School was an unbearable experience for Sydney. Here was a boy who grew up with a high degree of freedom. As soon as his chores were finished, he could spend the rest of the day out and about traipsing through Cat Island. But now in Nassau, he was expected not only to sit still at a desk and be quiet, but to actually pay attention. How could people put up with this? Sydney lasted just 18 months in school before he tapped out, which, according to him, was enough time to learn to read a little, write a little, and sing Rule Britannia. Afterward, the 13-year-old Poitier decided to quit school and get a job working as a laborer. Even though he was barely a teenager, Poitier grew up before his time in more ways than one. Physically, he had the body of an adult. He was six feet tall, and all those days of back-breaking labor quickly helped fill out his frame with muscles. He also developed an interest in girls. Sidney got his first girlfriend after arriving in Nassau, but then, just a year and a half later, he lost his virginity to a prostitute who gave him a parting gift of the clap. But the most troubling of all was the teenager's descent into petty thievery. Poitier stole everything that wasn't nailed down. Food, tools, comic books, empty bottles. Even if it was something he didn't want, he could still sell it and make some extra cash. Unsurprisingly, it didn't take long before a 14-year-old Poitier earned his first arrest and spent a night in jail. It would be fair to say that Sydney's circle of friends wasn't exactly the best influence on the young man. First, they took him to prostitutes. Then, they turned him into a minor criminal, but they all had their good parts. One day, they took Sydney to a place he'd never heard of before, something called a movie theater. Poitier was afraid to admit that he didn't know what a movie was, so he just went along with it and tried to play it cool. They saw a western, and suffice to say, Sydney enjoyed the experience, but he ruined his bluff after the movie when he went out of the back of the theater, thinking that the actors he just saw on the screen would be coming out through the stage door, still riding their horses. Even with this slight confusion, Sydney's first movie was a transformative episode for him. Ever since he was a little boy, he liked acting. He just didn't know what acting was or that people could actually do it for a living. But now, fed on a steady diet of westerns, gangster films, and screwball comedies, Poitier decided that Hollywood was the only place for him. Just one problem, though. California was a long way from Nassau. In fact, for a poor, uneducated black man from the Bahamas, it might as well have been on another planet. But every now and then, the fates show up and play their hands. That's what happens one afternoon when Sydney's best friend, Yorick, stole a bicycle and took it for a joyride. He was caught and arrested, and because juvenile delinquency was on the rise, the judge decided to make an example out of him and sentence him to four years for stealing a bike. Reginald Poitier couldn't stand the idea of his son meeting a similar fate and decided that Sydney needed to leave Nassau. His eldest son, Cyril, had managed to emigrate to Miami illegally and later even obtained citizenship by marrying an American woman. But Sydney didn't need to do any of that. He already had American citizenship thanks to his fortuitous premature birth. So, in January 1943, Sydney Poitier said goodbye to his mother, his siblings, and his friends as his father walked him to the pier, put him aboard a rundown old passenger ship, placed a few dollars in his hands, and waved him off as the now 15 year old Sydney traveled alone to start a new life in Miami. For Poitier, America was hardly the land of milk and honey. Life in the Bahamas was tough, and Nassau showed him for the first time the injustices of racial inequality, but at least there he was relatively safe. He had never been in danger simply for being black, but the American South was an entirely different kettle of fish. Oh, while staying with his brother, Sidney found a job as a delivery boy for a department store. One day, his route took him to Miami Beach, in a neighborhood full of lavish mansions owned by rich white people. He got off his bicycle, grabbed the package, walked up to the house, and rang the doorbell. An older white woman opened the door with scorn and contempt in her eyes. She screamed at Sidney, 
what the hell do you think you're doing? And demanded that he use the servant's entrance round the back before slamming the door in his face. For Poitier, this was simply confusing. He didn't even associate it with racism. He just wondered why he would waste time doing that when he was already in front of the main door. So anyway, he just left the package on the front doorstep, got back on his bicycle, thinking another job well done. But two nights later, Sydney was returning home from the movies and noticed that his entire neighborhood was in complete darkness. In a widespread panic, his brother's wife got out of the house and dragged Sydney inside, dropped him on the floor, and told him not to make a sound. What exactly prompted this reaction? Well, the white woman from the rich neighborhood had called the department store and told them what Poitier had done. She demanded his home address, which his boss had no qualms about giving, and then she informed the Ku Klux Klan, who were currently patrolling Sydney's neighborhood, looking for the black teenager who dared to use the front door of a white family's home. And the reason that the entire neighborhood was dark was that realistically the KKK would have taken any black person who had the misfortune of running into them while they were out for blood. That's how Poitier's time in Miami started, and it didn't get any better. He soon discovered that the police not only approved of the KKK's actions, but were just as bad. One night, a police car caught Sydney alone in a white neighborhood, hitchhiking after dark. They allowed him to leave, but drove behind him for 35 blocks at a slow pace while hurling racial insults, taunts, and whatever else they could think of at him, while at the same time warning Poitier that if he ever turned his head back, they would shoot him dead right there in the street. Unsurprisingly, Poitier hated Miami and wanted to get away as fast as possible. During that summer, Sydney found a job in Georgia working at a mountain resort near Atlanta. After six weeks of hard labor, Poitier saved up $39. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough to get him the hell out of Florida for good. He boarded a bus, destination Harlem, New York City. Upon arrival in New York City, the 16-year-old Poitier discovered that someone had stolen the money in his suitcase, leaving him with just the $3 in his pocket. It seemed that New York wasn't going to go easy on him either, but for the moment, Sydney was stunned by all the new sights and sounds, ranging from the glitz and glamour of Broadway to the salaciousness and the dissolution of adult theatres and gaming parlours that littered the streets of the Big Apple. For a few months, Poitier drifted from one job to another, dishwasher, drugstore clerk, butcher's assistant porter, longshoreman, construction worker. He never made much money, but each job allowed him to experience a different part of the city, so he didn't mind too much. It was a different matter when winter came along. He had never experienced a freezing winter before, and he had been kicked out of his apartment for not paying the rent. In the past, he had spent plenty of nights sleeping outside, but that wasn't an option anymore. In a desperate move, Poitier decided to join the army, lying about his age so that he could enlist. After basic training, he was assigned to the Veterans Administration Hospital in Long Island, caring for injured soldiers. Poitier only lasted a year, as he was ill-suited to the discipline of army life. He returned to New York with enough money in his pocket to find some place to live and resumed his life of minimum wage jobs. At first, he hoped to save enough money to return to Nassau, having grown completely disillusioned with America, but then he saw an ad that gave him hope of pursuing his lifelong dream. It read, Actors Wanted by Little Theatre Group. Apply in person at the American Negro Theatre. Unfortunately, Poitier's first audition didn't exactly scream a future Oscar winner. He could barely read, he was tone deaf, and he still had a strong Bahamian accent. In fact, he angered theatre founder Frederick O'Neill so much that he grabbed Poitier by the arm and threw him out the door and told him to become a dishwasher, which coincidentally was exactly Sydney's job at the time. Despite the harsh rejection, Poitier decided that this was a goal worth fighting for, so he didn't give up. In fact, it spurred him on. If he had been rejected politely, Poitier might have packed up his bags and returned to the Bahamas. But spite can be a powerful motivator, and now he wanted to succeed as an actor, just so that he could shove it in Frederick O'Neill's face. Over the following six months, he embarked on an ambitious journey of self-improvement and education, learning to read properly and getting rid of his West Indian accent. He modeled his speech after posh radio announcers like Norman Brokenshire, while an affable elderly Jewish waiter who worked at the same restaurant as Sydney helped him with his reading. If this was a movie, then Poitier's six months of education would have been presented in a 30-second training montage. Afterward, he would have wowed everybody with a second audition, and the entire audience would have gotten out of their chairs and clapped while Frederick O'Neill hung his head in shame. But, well, real life doesn't work like that. Poitier was only slightly better the second time around. He was accepted into the drama school's apprenticeship program, not because he was the second coming of Stanislavski, but because the school didn't have enough male recruits. Some of his fellow students included future movie co-stars such as Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee, and Harry Belafonte. After the three-month program was over, Poitier was asked to leave, but he begged for another semester, offering to work as the school janitor during that time. The extra training served Sydney well, and his acting chops were impressive enough to garner 
Poitier's first proper acting role in 1946 in an all-black production of Lysistrata, followed closely by another part in Anna Lacasta. A few more roles followed, but nothing to really turn people's heads. Poitier was just happy with the steady work. Then one day in 1949, he visited a talent agency to inquire about any upcoming auditions and discovered that 20th Century Fox was holding screen tests for Joseph Mankiewicz's film noir, No Way Out. What the hell, thought Poitier. He gave it a shot, even though he had already been cast in a play. He didn't think he had a chance of getting the part, but the director disagreed. Mankiewicz had found his actor, so he offered Poitier ten times what he was making on Broadway and booked him a first-class ticket and a luxury train to travel cross-country. After all this time, Sidney Poitier was finally heading to Hollywood. Poitier arrived in Los Angeles in late 1949, but he couldn't help but notice that it was just more of the same. Black people lived in isolation in the valley and worked menial jobs, while all the swanky neighborhoods and thriving industries were reserved for white people. At the studio lot, the only black people he saw were either janitors or kitchen workers. Even he, despite having the lead role, received fourth billing and the same salary as the supporting actors. But there were tiny baby steps of progress. Poitier came in at a time when Hollywood slowly but surely began casting black actors in movies that weren't a afraid to present the injustices they faced in society. They were given serious and complex roles, portraying actual people instead of singing and dancing caricatures or stereotypical villains. In No Way Out, Poitier played a doctor who was well-mannered, dressed in nice suits, and spoke with perfect diction. At the same time, his character highlighted a serious problem that the black community faced. That a black man needed to be exceptional in order to receive the same opportunities as his mediocre white counterpart. The movie was well received, and people took notice of Sidney Poitier. New offers came in steadily, and he made another dozen movies during the 1950s. Highlights included Cry the Beloved Country, which Poitier filmed in South Africa, Blackboard Jungle, which was selected for preservation by the Library of Congress, and Edge of the City, which was praised by numerous organizations, including the NAACP, for its message of racial brotherhood. But Poitier's biggest success of the decade uh, was Stanley Kramer's 1958 drama, The Defiant Ones, opposite Tony Curtis. The role earned Poitier an Oscar nomination for lead actor, a first for any black performer, as well as a Golden Globe nomination. He had even more success in Europe, walking away with a BAFTA from the British Academy of Film and a Silver Bear from the Berlin Film Festival. By this point, Poitier's talent had become undeniable, and there was no doubt that black or white, he was one of Hollywood's biggest rising stars. It was just a matter of time before his efforts would be rewarded with the greatest recognition that Hollywood could bestow, an Oscar. And that moment came in 1964. The previous year, Poitier had starred in Lilies of the Field, a comedy drama where he played an itinerant worker who helps a group of nuns build a chapel. The movie was a hit, earning five Academy nominations, and Sidney Poitier won Best Actor, becoming the first black performer to take home the award for a leading role, although a quick shout out here to Hattie McDaniel, who has the honor of being the first performer of color to win an Oscar for her supporting role in Gone with the Wind. Poitier's movie career peaked in 1967. He did three movies that year, To Sir With Love, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and In the Heat of the Night. All three were hits, and they officially turned Sidney Poitier into the biggest box office drawer of the year, yet another first for a black actor Actor, beating out the likes of Paul Newman, Julie Andrews, and Steve McQueen. But even as Poitier's acting career flourished, he had already set his sights on a new ambition, directing. He stepped behind the camera for the first time in 1972 for Buck and the Preacher, and then eight more times during his lifetime, also starring in five of the movies that he made. It's fair to say that Poitier's directional career had ups and downs. On the one hand, he made Stir Crazy, the Richard Pryor Gene Wilder comedy, which became the first movie from a black director to gross over $100 million. On the other hand, he also made the abysmal flop Ghost Dad, starring Bill Cosby. For Poitier, it was all quiet on the acting front during the 1980s as he entered semi-retirement. He took a 12-year hiatus from acting and re-emerged in the late 80s with a few forgettable thrillers. This culminated in 1997's The Jackal, which ended up being the actor's last appearance on the silver screen. During the 90s, Poitier relied mostly on television movies to flex his acting muscles. He was singled out for two dramas where he portrayed Nelson Mandela and Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. His last noteworthy role, if we may call it that, was that of narrator of his own autobiography, The Measure of a Man, which won Poitier the Grammy for Best Spoken Word or Non-Musical Album in 2001. Other than that, Sidney Poitier seemed content with a quiet life away from the spotlight. In his lifetime, he received a knighthood from Queen Elizabeth, the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama, another honor Oscar for lifetime achievement and scores of other honors, trophies, and awards. He died on January the 6th, 2022, at the age of 94, leaving behind an indelible legacy that forever changed not just Hollywood, but America. Mm -hmm.